Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I would like to read for you the first 13 verses, and then we will go before the throne above and ask the Spirit that we will be learning about to be with us. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13, listen as is appropriate to the word of the living God. But when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the crowd came together. And they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. Let's pray together. Father, you sent your spirit upon the church on this day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, a unique and unrepeatable event. But we are thankful that the work of your spirit did not end there. It only began. And so we come as your people, as your children, asking for the spirit of the living God to indwell this place, to indwell our hearts, and lead us into truth regarding what is revealed here. And we pray this that we might more passionately and more accurately love your son Jesus and proclaim his gospel. We ask through him, amen. So the time of waiting is over. This day, this event that the people of God had been anticipating for centuries had finally come. The day the apostles had been waiting for had finally come. Last week I used some metaphors to describe this waiting, kind of like a woman who finds out she's pregnant and she's waiting and waiting, waiting and waiting for the delivery of the child. Now, she doesn't know the exact date, but she knows around the time it's coming. Or when a couple becomes engaged and they're going to get married and they set a date and the waiting period can be very hard and very long, but at least they know when that time is going to come. But in this case, century after century, they waited and waited for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And even Jesus said, go in Jerusalem and wait. They didn't know when, just knew someday, one of these days, the Spirit is going to come. And now we get to the day of Pentecost, and the day is finally here. The waiting is over. And we find the the disciples gathered together in one place. Luke doesn't bother telling us. If it's more than the 12, it could be all 120. He doesn't tell us whether they're in the upper room or just somewhere, some room, but they're in a room, 
and they're carrying on, they're doing what they do, they're talking, they're praying, I don't know, they're together, and then suddenly, without warning, they hear out of the heavens a sound similar to a roaring, violent windstorm. In Colorado, you have been around some wind. I'm from the Midwest, and it gets windy there. In Chicago, I know it's called the Windy City, but that's because of politics. But here in Colorado, we know something about wind. You've been out there where it's hard to hear one another speak, even standing next to each other, because it's so strong, and the the trees are bending over. Maybe some of you have been around close enough to a tornado, where you see the effects of the wind, of course, as the trees really are bent over, and you're scared, but the sound is deafening. That's what happened here. There was no wind, there was no movement of trees and things, but the same Violent, roaring sound came out of heaven into the city and into the very room in which they were gathered. Then, as the sound fills the room, they see tongues, floating tongues, apparently one that divided, not of fire, but it looked like fire. Nobody got burned. But it looked like fire, and it began to divide and rest upon these 12 men. Then they started speaking. But they weren't speaking Greek. They weren't even speaking Hebrew or Aramaic. They were speaking all kinds of languages, none of which they had learned. Can you imagine The chaos and the confusion that would have been going on in that room. This noise, you know how it is when things get really, really loud, it's hard to think. Sometimes you're driving in the car and you've got little kids, you tell them, please be quiet. I need to think about where we're going here. And then they see these strange visions, these strange tongues, and then they start speaking in other languages. It would have been a pretty odd situation. But the apostles did not simply sit around staring at one another saying, whoa. They went out into town, into Jerusalem, and they began to proclaim the mighty deeds of God. Now, why did they do that? Because they got it. They had been listening to Jesus say, I'm going to send my spirit. They'd been wrestling with all that he had taught them from the Old Testament, and as he lived his life, and they got it. See, John the Baptist had said several years before this to these same disciples, there is one coming who will baptize you with the Spirit and fire. In the Hebrew language and in the Greek language, the word for wind is the same as the word for for spirit. So the association between spirit and wind is a no-brainer for these men. And John had said, he will baptize you with fire. Now they get it. Then they see the fire, it looks like fire in the shape of tongues. What's their mission? Their mission is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every tribe, tongue, and nation on planet earth. And they sit around for a moment, they hear the wind, they see the tongues of fire, they remember their mission, and they get it. It is time to go. This is the Spirit coming upon us. We have power from on high. We're speaking languages we didn't learn. We're simple Galilean fishermen. We are not highly educated. We are not polyglots who have studied this, that, and the other language. We know one language, and that one's not very well, maybe a couple, but certainly not all these others. But this is the power from on high preparing us for the mission, let's go. And they went out into the city and they began proclaiming in all these strange languages that they didn't know the mighty things of God. Now Luke changes the scene. That's the first 
four verses. Now Luke changes the scene to what's going on out there. And there are men rushing to the middle of town because they all heard the noise. They all heard the rushing wind sound. And they show up, and here are these 12 Galileans saying the great mighty acts of God in strange languages. But they're not strange to the visitors. In fact, they're marveling. They're saying, those guys, those Galileans, are speaking in our languages. And Luke lists for us a variety of countries to represent all the nations of the earth that were gathered here. Now, these were probably not Jews who came for the Pentecost feast. That was going on. This is, what, this is Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. This was the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest that the Jews celebrated. It was a a time of celebration for the good things of God, the harvest God had brought, the good fruits that He had poured out upon them. It went all the way back to the time of Passover. They were to gather together. This is one of the major festivals of the Jews. And they were all gathered here on this Pentecost, but these visitors, or these, these men described here, were probably not new in town just for Pentecost because... Verse 5 says there were Jews living in Jerusalem. That word, if you were here on Wednesday night, is the same word as Christ dwelling in our hearts. It's a word that communicates a settling down. These were probably people who had been born abroad. They were part of the dispersion. Do you remember when God judged Israel centuries earlier? And the Babylonians and Assyrians and others came down and carried them off into foreign lands? It was their exile, their judgment for their idolatry. And these families then began to preserve the best they could their Jewish faith wherever they were at. And century after century and generation after generation, people preserved their Judaism, but some of them, when the opportunity came, moved back to Jerusalem. And so they came learning Greek, possibly Aramaic, maybe a few learned Hebrew, but they also learned their native mother tongue. And so they come back and they, they live, they relocate back to Jerusalem, and they are living here, and they hear this sound, and they rush together saying, what is going on? They hear the roaring sound, and now they're hearing these simpletons speaking a variety of languages. Some scholars have done research and discovered that Galileans probably had some kind of a speech impediment where they couldn't pronounce all of uh, the vowels and consonants the way they should, these were not the kind of men who were going to be good translators and interpreters. They didn't know these languages, and all these people gathering around knew that. And they're astonished. Did you notice how many times and how many different ways Luke expresses their state of mind? Look at verse 6. When the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered. Verse 7, they were amazed and astonished, verse 12, and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. This sound was intense. It came out of heaven and it got their attention. This was unexplainable. It wasn't thunder. It wasn't something they'd heard before. It was loud and it was unique. And now they hear people preaching the mighty acts of God, probably going back to Genesis and creation probably the exodus and the plagues and all that God had, did, had done to show his power throughout the Old Testament. They're hearing these works in their own language and they are utterly bemused. What is going on? What does this mean? There is no natural explanation for this. At least that's what most of them were saying. Some others came up with a different theory. They're drunk. But that doesn't explain the intelligibility of their speech. If they were drunk, they might be babbling, but they wouldn't be babbling in languages that make sense. English speakers who get drunk don't even speak English intelligibly, much less are they having to launch into Italian or something. So Peter stands up. Let's look. Verse 14 and following. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose. 
It's only the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. Come on. No, they're not drunk. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Here's the quote. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my Spirit on all mankind, literally on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my bond slaves, both men and women. I will in those days pour forth my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I need to ask you a question at this point. How did Peter know that this was fulfilling what Joel said? If you've been playing along for the last few weeks, you know the answer. Because he's reading the Old Testament and as a Christian, he's got the message. When Jesus says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on you, go and wait for it in Jerusalem, I have no doubt that Peter began scouring, devouring the Old Testament, looking for how it pointed to Christ. We're going to see this through his entire sermon. Several passages he pulls forward and says, this applies to Christ. And when he hears the promise of the Spirit is coming, he no doubt looks, out, looks up all the passages that deal with the coming of the Spirit, and Joel 2 is one of the major ones. And so when it happens, he says, I get it. I understand. Men of Judea, men of Jerusalem, men of Israel, these people are not drunk. This is exactly what God said would happen. And he quotes from Joel 2. Now, there are five things in Joel's quote that you need to key in on because Peter is going to expound them through the sermon. Let me draw your attention to the first and major one. It's probably not the one you think. The first and major one is at the end of verse 20, before the great and glorious day of the Lord. The word translated glorious there isn't the normal Greek word for glory. This means awesome. If you have the ESV, I think it says magnificent. This is an intense day, but it can also be translated terrible. Beloved, when the Old Testament prophets spoke about the day of the Lord, it was a terrifying day. Let me read to you an account from Zephaniah. We'll put it up so that you can read along. This is what Zephaniah, or God through Zephaniah, said about this day. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end indeed a terrifying one on all the inhabitants of the earth it is a great and awesome and terrifying day that is coming the day of the lord you need to keep that in your thinking as we go through the rest of this passage. It is important. But God says, before that day, I'm going to do some things. Number two, I am going to pour out my spirit. He says it twice. It forms an inclusio. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. That doesn't mean every human being. It means all of his people. 
And no longer will there be distinctions. In the Old Covenant, it was the prophet, the king, the special one who was called for a specific purpose, who was filled with the Spirit of God. But God says, someday, before the day of the Lord, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all of my people. It doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you are a slave or a freeman. All of my people will have my spirit and they will prophesy. They will declare my things. That's number two. Number three is in verse 19. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Mark that well. We'll come, to the back, come back to that very shortly. Signs and wonders will precede this day. Number four is verse 21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Before the day of the Lord comes, God says, I will make it so that everyone who calls upon my name will be rescued from that wrath. And the fifth one is invisible. You'll just have to trust me on that for a few minutes. So keep those five things in mind and let's see what Peter goes on to say. Men of Israel... Listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through Him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Did you catch that? Joel 2 says, I will perform signs and wonders. And Peter says, men, you live here. You were around for the last three years. If you didn't see it firsthand, you certainly heard about it. Everybody's heard about it. Jesus was attested by God through signs and wonders. Nicodemus, one of the leaders of the Jews, stole away at night, remember in John chapter 3? And he comes to Jesus and he says, look, Jesus, we know you're from God. How do we know that? Because look at the things you're doing. We understand nobody can do these things unless God is with him. We know you are from God. Peter says, men, you were here. You heard about it. Some of you saw it firsthand. Jesus saying a word and a leper is cleansed instantly. Jesus taking a handful of fishes and loaves and feeding thousands of people. Some of you were there, he says. You know this. Casting out demons with just a word, where these evil spirits obeyed him and submitted to him without resistance. Turning water into wine. Even calling forth people who were dead. And they got up and walked. Before the day of the Lord, God is sending signs and wonders. And he did it through Jesus. And he says, men of Israel, you know this about Jesus. This man, he says, verse 23, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. When Peter says this was happened according to the predetermined purpose and plan of God, what is he saying there? Now, if you're like me, you want to jump immediately to the theology of God's sovereignty and such. And that's a good place to go here. But I think he probably has a little more specific something in mind. Not simply that God had planned this from before the foundation of the world, which he had, but he had revealed that plan over and over again in the Old Testament. This is not new information Peter's giving them. It's all over their pages of Scripture. See, Peter now understands. He understands Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, is about Jesus. He had to die. This was God's plan. The servant would come and die. Peter now understands fully when all the times when Jesus said, 
I must go to Jerusalem and die because that's what the Scripture says. That's what has been predicted. That's my Father's will as revealed in the Old Testament. Peter gets that fully now. I'm sure right here he is totally embarrassed about the times when he pulled Jesus aside and said, Stop talking about dying. You're not going to die. You're the Messiah. Messiahs don't die. They rule and reign. Now he realizes he had to die. Of course, it was God's plan. It was revealed all through Scripture. He understood now the imagery of all those animals that were substituted for the people of Israel so they could, their sins could be atoned for. They can't atone for sins. It was all talking about Christ. It says, men of Israel, this was predetermined and planned by God. He knew it beforehand because it was all his design. He revealed it. However, you are not off the hook here. Yes, maybe this was God's plan, but you are the ones who nailed him to a cross. Yes, the Romans were the ones who actually pounded the nails and poked the spear. But the reason they did that is because you men of Israel relentlessly clamored for his death. Crucify him. Crucify him. You wouldn't let up. Pilate almost had no other option. You killed him with the hands of the Romans, is what Peter says to these Jews. But, what an important word that is in the Bible. But, God raised him up again. You killed him, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible to, for him to be held in its power. You killed him. He cannot stay dead. It's impossible for him to stay dead. God raised him up again. Why is it impossible for him to stay dead? Now again, we want to launch into a theology right here. Well, it's impossible for him to stay dead because he's the Son of God. The Son of God can't be dead. It's impossible for him to stay dead because he wasn't a sinner. And once he would paid the price for our sin, he can't stay dead. He's got to come back to life because he doesn't deserve to die. Those are both true. But it's not the reason Peter brings to the bear. Now, if you have the NIV, you are missing a crucial word. This is why I don't use NIV. In the NIV, the first word of verse 25 is David, right? It's not the first word. The first word is for. That's crucial. Here is why it was impossible for him to stay dead. Because David said he wouldn't stay dead. Because God had predicted through David centuries ago, when he comes, he would not stay dead. Here's what Psalm 16 says. I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You've made known to me the ways of life. You will make make me full of gladness with your presence. And Peter goes on then, expounding that text. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. You killed him, but he can't stay dead because centuries ago David said about him, he will not see decay. He will not stay dead. God had planned this. He had foretold this all the way through. David, of course, was writing of his relationship with God. And he believed that God would preserve him. That's how Psalm 16 starts, preserve me. But he didn't expect that he was going to live forever or even come back to life immediately. Peter tells us David was writing as a prophet, foreseeing that when Messiah came, he would die, but God would not let him stay dead. He would raise him up. Furthermore, Peter reasons, the promise 
that David would always have a descendant on the throne could only be fulfilled if someone died and came back to, came back to life. In Peter's time, there wasn't even a king of Jerusalem. There wasn't a kingdom of Israel. There was nobody on the throne. So how is God going to fulfill his plan to put one of David's descendants forever on the throne? It all is clicking for him in the resurrected Messiah. And so David was speaking as a prophet, anticipating the resurrection of Christ, and that's what he meant when he said he didn't abandon me to Hades or let his flesh suffer. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. We 12 men standing before you, men of Israel, we can tell you firsthand. This is not speculation. This is not hearsay. We can tell you we've seen him, we've talked with him, we've eaten with him. This man, Jesus, that you killed is alive. We bear witness to this fact. You see what Peter's doing there? He's fulfilling his mission. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem with the Jews, saying we are witnesses of his resurrection. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter says, men of Israel, Jesus was dead, He is now alive, and He is gone to the right hand of God where he sits now reigning. This can't be David. It can't be David for two reasons. Number one, we still have his tomb. David did suffer decay. He was abandoned to Hades. Go dig up his grave. You'll see his bones. This is talking about Christ. Secondly, David didn't ascend. David didn't go up. David is not the one speaking, spoken of in Psalm 110. This psalm is quoted more than any other in the New Testament. Jesus himself used it to confound the Jewish leaders. Peter was with him on those occasions. He got it. David said, look at the, look at the passage here. David says, the Lord, that's God. That's Yahweh. That's the name God gave to Moses that was used throughout the Old Testament. The Lord Yahweh said to my Lord. Now David is the king of Israel when he's writing this. He's the highest in the land. He's the one everybody calls Lord. And he's saying that one of his descendants would be his Lord. Now that doesn't matter too much in our culture, but in antiquity that was really significant. The younger folks called the older folks respectful things. Not like our culture. A son of David would refer to David as Lord. But David says, Yahweh is speaking to someone else who is my Lord. That's Messiah. And what does Yahweh say to the Messiah? Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's not David who ascended that's Messiah, Jesus. Now, why do you think he quoted verse 35? Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter has an agenda here. It's the day of the Lord. It's judgment day that he's concerned about. Notice how he concludes his sermon. Therefore... Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Messiah. 
And you, men of Israel, need to know this because his enemies are going to be crushed beneath his feet. Did you notice in verse 33 a switch that took place? Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, He poured forth this, which you see in here. In Joel 2, in Ezekiel 36, in all the other passages, God says, I will pour out my Spirit. I will do it. It's my spirit. Something has changed. Now that Christ has been made Lord, now that he has been entrusted with authority over heaven and earth, remember he said that at the Great Commission? All authority, every bit of it, every ounce of it, in heaven and on earth is all now mine. Now the Father gives to his Son, the King, the Spirit and says, you pour him out. That has elevated the Messiah to equality with God. This is who Jesus is, men of Israel. He's the one who poured out the Spirit. Now again, they both did it. Don't get in. This is not a, they're, they're on the same team. Remember, this is not a competition. But it's fascinating to observe that switch. Men of Israel, Jesus, who you killed, God raised him back, just as he said he would. He is now seated at the right hand. He's poured forth his spirit. This is Jesus, who's Lord and Christ. And by the way, you crucified him. Why does he keep reminding them of that? Because he wants them to understand all of this, the pouring out, of the Spirit, the signs and wonders were all coming prior to Judgment Day. And can you imagine standing before God at Judgment? Even if you had no other sin on your account, but you had this one, you were responsible for the crucifixion of his son. That's bad news. Now, of course, they had many, many other sins, but Peter wants them to understand, now that these signs have been fulfilled, judgment day could be right around the corner, and you are not ready. And by the way, implied in the, in the uh, titles of Lord and Christ is judge. So this Jesus whom you crucified, men of Israel, is your judge on Judgment Day. How are you feeling about that, men of Israel? It's not a good place to be. How do they respond? Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest, Brethren, What do we do? We're convinced. First, the sound that is unexplainable and overwhelming and chaotic. Then we hear you guys speaking languages we know you didn't learn. And you're proclaiming to us the mighty acts of God. And now you're telling us you have seen Jesus alive, verifying the word of God. And now you're telling us that that Jesus who we killed is our Lord and our Messiah and our judge. What do we do? Is there any hope for us? Have we crossed the line? Are we doomed to the day of destruction, the day of gloom, the day of darkness, the day when God will destroy everyone? What do we do? Peter said to them, Repent. Repent. It's a a word that literally means change your mind. You've had this view of Christ, that he was a fraud, that he was a blasphemer, 
Change your thinking about him. Accept him now as who he really is. He is the Lord and Messiah and judge. Believe that. And prove your belief. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is important. Going back to verse 21. Before that great and awesome day, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Beloved, that's what baptism is. It is the appeal to God for a clean conscience, Peter will go on to say. This is the act, the biblical act of calling upon the name of the Lord. Look with me at Acts chapter 22, verse 16. We'll put it up here for you. Here's what Ananias said to Paul when Paul was converted and Paul was convinced <coughs> that he was under God's judgment, under Jesus' judgment. Ananias says to him, now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. This is the sinner's prayer. The prayer to receive Christ is intended to be baptism. See, we separate them. When someone come, becomes a Christian, we want to have them pray with us, and then somewhere down the road, maybe weeks, months, years, we'll baptize them. But that's not the way the New Testament sets it up. Peter says, show that your mind is changed and call upon his name in baptism. And you will receive two things. Number one, the forgiveness of your sins. All of them. All of them. Everything you have done, idolatry, blasphemy, distorting the word of God, all of the heart sins. Remember Jesus repeatedly re rebuked the Jews for having hard hearts, sinful hearts. They're all forgiven, Peter says, all of them. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. God said this would happen. The second promise, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that empowered us to speak these foreign languages. The same Spirit that is represented by that overwhelming noise. It's yours. If you repent... If you accept who Christ really is, if you call upon His name for salvation, the Spirit of God will indwell you and you'll have the same power. That's what you do. That's what you do when you're a sinner. You repent. And you call upon His name and all of your sins are forgiven and His Spirit comes to empower you. And then verse 39 is one of the verses that you are in. There are only a few of them. This is one of them. Peter says, This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Probably Peter has primarily in mind the Jews here because the promise was to the children of Israel. But what we now understand is it extends beyond, way beyond Jerusalem, beyond Judea, into Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And you and I, if we are believers, are those who are far off. That He has called to Himself. And the promise is for you and our children, all who believe the gospel will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. My intent right now is to come back next week and spend all of next week on the Holy Spirit. So you can pray my wisdom on whether I should do that or not. But assuming I'm going to do that, I'm going to move on from here. Here's the secret, the invisible one from Joel 2. Notice he says, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now when he quoted Joel 2, he stopped a phrase early. But the whole thing is in his mind. Because look at what comes in Joel 2 that he didn't read in a quote. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord 
calls. Peter understood that's talking about Jesus. That's talking about the gospel going out. He says, men of Israel, the promise of the Holy Spirit is yours and your children, and as many as are far off, as many in every nation, every tongue, every tribe, as many as God will call to himself. He said, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And guess what? You cannot do that unless the Lord first calls you. He calls you, and then you call upon him. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. We don't have all the words to Peter's sermon. I'm thankful for that because I'm convinced he probably preached for two or three hours. Over and over again, words after words, he is telling them repeatedly, Be saved. Notice he says, Be saved from this perverse generation. Do you remember how many times Jesus said that about those people? Let's run through a few of them very, very quickly in Luke. Thank you. Luke 9. Jesus answered, you unbelieving and perverted generation. Next one. And the crowds were increasing. He began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. Next one. So that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Talking about the Jews who lived at that time. Next. Jesus says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Is there another one? No. Over and over and over again, Christ himself said this is a perverse generation. They've made idols their gods. They've rejected the truth of God. They distort the truth. Peter says, be saved from them. Don't be like them. Come out from them and join the new people, the true Israel, who obeys Messiah. And you'll be saved from the day of wrath that is coming. Now I have here an apostolic number of points I need to make. I'm going to go through them very quickly, at least some of them. I will make this list available. Uh, check the website the next day or two, and we'll put this up on the blog. It's on the, on the left side of the front page of the, uh, of the FRAC website. I'll put these there so you can go back through them. But let me run through some of them very quickly. Notice that the purpose of the Spirit at Pentecost was not to draw attention to himself, but to Christ. See, we think of Acts 2 and we think of the day of Pentecost, we think of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and we should. But the Spirit's goal was drawing attention to Christ. Now, I'm one of those who is convinced that we give far too little attention to the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of becoming charismaniacs. And so, we sort of say, okay, the Spirit's kind of involved, He's involved in regeneration, but I don't want to get too wrapped up in praying in the Spirit walking in the Spirit, listening for the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. We, we, we don't really know what those things mean, and we must. It is vital to walking worthy of Christ. However, we must always remember the Spirit does not come ever to draw attention to Himself. His purpose is to exalt Christ. And his work in us will always be to exalt Christ. And that leads to point number two. Peter's sermon, do you notice? The day of Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out. Peter does not go out and start raving about the Spirit. He calls men to repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter understands the Spirit is a tool, to use a very impersonal term, for the proclamation of the gospel. His focus in his sermon is Christ, not the Spirit. Number three, the tongues was a miracle of speaking, not hearing. Sometimes you'll hear people say, the real, the real marvel here is that all these people heard the mighty acts of God in their own language. Where maybe these guys were just babbling something, but God changed the hearing of the people. That is not what Luke says. Luke says just the opposite. What they were doing was speaking languages they had never learned. And that's why they heard it, because they understood it, because they were from those different places. 
Number four, Pentecost was a unique, never-to-be-repeated event. We should not be looking for a new Pentecost. Now, the effects continue, just like the effects of the cross continue. But it happened once and only once. Number five, the list of nations that Luke gives us here, you wouldn't know this, and I wouldn't know this, except some scholar has done the research, and all of these different people groups can be tied back to the table of nations in Genesis 10. If you remember what happened in Genesis 10, that's where Noah and his three sons are mentioned and their offspring. You recall, all of us go back to Noah, right? And therefore, all of us go back to Noah's three sons. Well, as the Bible begins to show where the sons of Ham went, the sons of Shem went, and the sons of Japheth went, Luke has represented all three of those groups. This is why he can say all the world, all the nations were represented here, even though he didn't list, you know, like America or anything. But what happened in Genesis 11? The Tower of Babel. Where all these descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth spread out through the world and they become corrupt and they unite and say, we're going to build a great tower and we're going to make a name for ourselves. And God says, no, you're not. And how did he judge them? How did he curse them? He spread them across the world and gave them different languages. On the day of Pentecost, the curse is undone. It's redeemed. Not by giving them all one language, but by giving them one story in all their languages. The new creation has begun. All the sin brought into this world, God is in the process of undoing, and this changes, overturns, and redeems the curse of Babylon. Number six, miracles are not self-authenticating. We sometimes think, boy, if we just had that power today, if we could do these signs and wonders, people would be converted in droves. No, they wouldn't. Some would be saying, you guys are drunk. It's never enough. It's never enough just to wow somebody. If your heart is hardened, you will find some other explanation. If the Spirit of God is not preparing the heart, and if the truth of the gospel is not proclaimed, miracles will do nothing in and of themselves. Number seven, there is most likely a correlation between the baptism for forgiveness and the sprinkling of cleansing in Ezekiel. I'm not going to develop this here, but think about it sometimes. Ezekiel 36, God says, when I pour out my spirit, I will sprinkle you clean and forgive all of your sins. Baptism as the appeal to God, the, the calling upon the Lord for salvation, the washing away of sins represents the cleansing that comes now that we have accepted Christ. Number eight, we need to read the Old Testament as Christians. Are you doing that yet? I hope so. Number nine, the cross was God's predetermined plan to redeem his people. It was not a reaction. It was his design all along. From before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. That's his purpose in redeeming his people. The Jews and the Romans did not change God's course. That does not free them from responsibility, however. Number 10, we too live among a perverse generation. And we need to call people to be saved from it. We live among a people that are wicked and evil, and they distort the truth, and they reject God, they reject His Messiah. They do all the things these Jews did. And we need to appeal to people to come out and be rescued from them. Number 10, 11. I told you, I have 12. I told you it was an apostolic number. You didn't believe me, did you? Number 11. Do you understand the Holy Spirit has been given to you Does that mean anything to you in your daily life? We're going to come back to that, I believe, next week. If not, we're going to come back to it because it recurs throughout the book of Acts. Number 12, 
Do you see the immeasurable grace of God and what happened here? What I didn't read was that on that day, 3,000 people responded to the gospel. These were not just 3,000 anybodies. These were 3,000 people who just recently were saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. If anybody should have been under the irrevocable wrath of God, it's people who said, crucify his son. God said, nope. I'm not judging all of you. I'm a gracious God. It's who I am. 3,000 of those who were responsible for the death of Messiah, God redeemed. Oh, he is a gracious God. It also tells us that rejecting Christ is not the unpardonable sin. Have you heard that? It's not true. The only way it becomes the unpardonable sin is if you die in unbelief. Then there's no potential for pardon. But as long as there is breath in someone's body, no matter what he or she has done in their life, no matter how many times they've said, Jesus is not the Son of God, the gospel is not true. As long as they have breath, there is the possibility in God's grace for repentance and cleansing and the filling of the Spirit. Don't ever give up hope for anyone who's alive. And there is no sin. Beloved, I, I, I know some of your sins. You know them more than I do, and I've got my own. There is no sin, none, that you have committed that God has a hard time forgiving. There is, in this room, represented some pretty awful things. But if God can forgive the people who killed His Son, thousands of them at one shot, Whatever you have done doesn't compare. If you are a believer and you struggle, listen to this message. Forgiveness is total and complete and eternal in Christ. God is over it. You need to get over it. And if you are not a Christian and you're here today, there is no sin you've committed that God will say no. They killed his son. He said yes. He will grant you forgiveness and he will give you the power of the spirit of the living God. Call upon his name today.